Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and friends and colleagues, on behalf of the Institute of, of Economics, <clears throat> I would like to welcome you to join this conference, um, the uh, 1916, Thai, uh, sorry, 2016 Thai, Taipei International Conference on Growth, Trade and Dynamics. And um, we are honored to have the opportunity to host this conference. And this is actually, um, the fifth, fifth um, conference um, on this topic. The first one was held in uh, 1999, the Taipei International Conference on Economic Growth. And then the second, second one was in 1998. Uh, sorry, the first one is in 1998. And the second one was in 1999. And third one was in 2004. The the uh, fourth one was um, in 2010, so this is the fifth one and, uh, in 2016. <clears throat> and in this um, conference, the program features five keynote speeches uh, delivered by Professor Eric Lipper from Indiana University, uh, Valerie Remy from um, UC San Diego, and Rafu, Rafu Kima, uh, Kuma from Federal Reserve of St. Louis, <clears throat> um, Jacques Francois Fies from uh, uh, Louvain and Earth, oh, University of Louvain and Earth, it's it called, right? Um, and Ping Wang from um, Washington University in St. Louis. And it, in addition you know, to these five keynote speakers, we have seven invited speakers. Um, they are lead, leading scholars in their areas of research. And moreover, we have 90 contributed papers um, by people um, from Taiwan and also various countries. So uh, I hope that your stay in Taipei is enjoyable and productive. Um, so um, next will be a keynote speech. Um, then uh, Professor Pong will be the chairman of this uh, keynote speech. So, uh, good afternoon, uh, all uh, my friends and uh, colleagues. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, chair the first uh, keynote of this conference. And uh, please give me a couple of minutes to uh, introduce uh, Professor Jackis uh, before uh, his presentation. Uh, I think the Professor Jack Tis, uh, is a very established and uh, distinguished scholar on the uh, industrial organization, international trade, and the urban economies. He published may maybe more than the 400, 500 the paper. No, no, no. I no if no, you... No, 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 no. If you Google, you know, you Google, you no, can no, no. find the publications uh, no, uh, no. different uh, categories. But the quantity is not important. I think I must be say he uh, usually is a development very frontier the model. The most famous is the, like in 1979, this uh, premier and him uh, proof the minimum uh, product differentiation in the one dimension is not exist. Oh, this this result is substantial 50 years. But finally, he proved this is not stable unit equipment. And uh, recently, you know, he developed another frontier work on the international trade. Uh, most of the uh, international trade use the CES, the framework, to study the, uh, the trade. But uh, a, a three, uh, four years ago, he tried to develop another VES, like a variable in a test state. Uh, substitution of framework and the publishing in, in Informatica. So he usually development many, many frontiers, the model and the, in the different field. Uh, and also, you know, I took his, his course, I of course, in 1985, right. when he visited Japan. And I learned and benefited much from him. So it's my honor and the pleasure to introduce him and uh, please enjoy me to welcome Professor Tis. Jack. <laughs>
First of all, I, w I, I don't have 400 papers, right? No, no, I, not even 300. It's much, much lower than that. You know, so, I mean, uh, Shinkun is too nice. Uh, that's, that's, I would like also to thank the organizer and, uh, for, having organi for having invited me. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I was in Japan uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and then I returned to Europe. I went to a workshop and then a summer school in Barcelona. As you know, the Spanish people like to go for dinner very late, right? 10 p.m. or something like that. So I have all sort of jet lags. And it's not too easy because when you get older, it becomes more and more painful. Anyway, I will do my best. Uh, this, my talk is based on a chapter for the forthcoming handbook of game theory and industrial organization. And as you probably know, the I.O. people dislike monopolistic competition. Whereas the trade people, many trade people, and quite a few growth people use monopolistic competition. Right? So writing for people in I.O., I say, OK, it's monopolistic competition. And I'm not going to apologize for that. Right? So in a sense, you know, my co-author, Philippe Uchef, and I fight on one front with the I.O. people. But we also tried to tell the trade people, I mean, you know, you should not necessarily use the CES model of monopolistic competition. You can do something much better. So we're fighting on two fronts. With, uh, you know, I mean, convincing people is very hard, especially in trade, because the CES model is almost ubiquitous, right? You can find it all over, all over the places. So what I hope to show you is that actually there is a lot to say about monopolistic competition. But for most people, it's just the Dick Stiglitz model of monopolistic competition. And if you read the paper, and actually many people cite the paper, but don't read it anymore, uh, the CS is one example. They work with additive preference. The model is more general. And they illustrate their results with the CS. Now, what makes this model so popular? You know, until the mid-70s, you know, the economic theory was dominated by the Jean-Luc Equilibrium, the Arrow de Bruyne model of Jean-Luc Equilibrium. But at the same time, we understood that, especially in growth, right, the Solow's model, which is, OK, where does technological progress come from? Now, how to explain in trade theory, intra-industry trade. Right? Same thing in uh, urban economics. Why do we have cities and this kind of stuff? And that's not something you can explain with the Arrow de Bray model without changing the model. Right? So one way to change it is to follow Remer or Henderson to introduce externalities. Another one is to say, OK, and this was the, you know, the, the only alternative model in town was the Excel and Stiglitz. So many people jump onto this model because it was an alternative with imperfect competition and increasing return to scale. So there was a model that they needed to deal with endogenous growth, to deal with city formation, and for many you know, uh, other issues, which are extremely well uh, explained and, descri and described by uh, an old paper by Matsuyama, Gel 1995. But as an I.O. person, I mean, you know, I didn't like the model either. Right? And then when I read Matsuyama, I said, oh, oh, I mean, they can do a lot with this model. Right? It's very interesting. But because of my old training, say, using an explicit functional form like this, it's an example. So can we build a theory on an example? No. Right? We need something more general. Right? Something more general. But what to do? Okay, that's what I will try to, to show you. Now, there is also an older literature, which is very interesting, that goes back to the 1980s. Right. And that's what I will uh, briefly describe here. But what I want to say is that, unlike some people, when, when Chamberlain published his book, there was very harsh debates about uh, monopolistic ambition. Many people, and it's interesting, from the left, like Joanne Robinson, to the right, like Milton Friedman or George, uh, George Tegler, argue this does not mean in any sense. Right? 
if you have a large number of firms, you get perfect competition. And so for years and years, we just didn't know, does this model make sense? It was not a model formally, right? It was just a set of ideas. Does it make any sense or not? And it's only in the 80s with the work of Oliver Hart that we, we get the, the, the beginning of an answer to, to these kind of questions. So the roadmap of my talk is very simple, right? Uh, I will summarize the two main approaches. In the first one, which is the old one, monopolistic competition is viewed like the limit of oligopolistic competition. You keep re replicating the supply side. You have more and more firms, or you could say the market size with respect to fixed costs you know, get smaller and smaller and smaller. Does this converge to what perfect competition? Or do firms still charge a positive markup at the limit, in the limit? Right? That's okay. Second, which is more what the approach we take nowadays, is to assume we have a non-atomic game, in a simple way, a continuum of firms, to capture chambering ideas that what a firm does has no impact on the market. So, first approach, monopolistic competition as the limit of OC. Because product differentiation is central to monopolistic competition, the first question is, how do we model monopolist, uh, product differentiation? Now, there are at least three different approaches in the literature. One is, what variety seekers? Right? We, we like to try, we like nice dinner, but we want to have Chinese food, you know, but Maybe some Japanese food is nice too. Well, Italian food is not bad either, right? Let's go to an Italian restaurant. And maybe the French restaurant and so on and so forth, right? So we diversify, which formally means that we have convex preferences. Right? It's the same thing. Okay? Second approach, well, that was the approach developed by hoteling. I mean, she could mention hoteling, I mean, which is the special model, which is actually Lancaster, right? A product is defined by a bundle of characteristics which belong to some space of characteristics. And then firms choose a product and you have an ideal product. We are heterogeneous. You have another ideal product. I have another one. And then we look at products which are made available, supplied by firms on the market. A third approach, which is a sort of synthesis between the first two, are the discrete choice model in which we have a probability to buy the ideal product, but still we also have a positive probability to buy some other product. So, like in spatial model, we have an ideal product, but still, like in variety-seeking model, we have a positive probability to buy a product which is away from our ideal product. Okay? So it is in this respect that it may view a little bit like a synthesis of the first two approaches. Now, what happened when we look at oligopoly model in these three settings and take the limit when the number of firms grows indefinitely? Variety seeking consumers. So let's, Oliver Hart develop, of course, general equilibrium model. The papers are very tough, right? And we have many technical assumptions. So I say, okay, let's do something in IO, partial equilibrium. If we can get a neat answer in a partial equilibrium, we already learned something. So let's start with something. You know, I always like to start with a very simple model because I do believe we can learn something with such model. And then you can move toward more general and more complicated model afterwards. So you see we have the numeraire or the outside good, as we call. And then here we have additive preference which are nested into an upper utility function where phi is concave and increasing. Everybody knows that. And lowercase u, which is the subutility, is also concave and, and increasing. Now, this include the CS, this include the Kara, this include Sarah, this include Stone Gere. Now, there is another one which is used in, uh, in trade by Simonovska and coaches called the Adilog. So, th there are quite a few preferences, which are all mainly used in empirical papers. I mean, that belong to this category. Now, we need a measure of concavity here, right? The concavity of these functions. 
And you remember the Arrow-Pratt measures, right? The absolute rate or the relative rate, degree of aversion to uh, uncertainty. This one is the relative. And that's why we call it the relative law for variety. Okay? In other words, you know, it's a measure of the concavity of U. And you see, if it is very concave, right, intuitively speaking, if it is very concave, you have more incentive to disperse your consumption across many, many varieties. Now, if you have things which are perfectly substitutes, if varieties are perfectly substitutes, it's a linear function, and you don't care. You buy x1, you buy x2, x1 plus x2 is the same thing, because they are perfect substitutes. So in this case, linear, the second derivative is 0, so the relative law for variety is 0. So it's a measure, not the a measure, there are many, right? A measure of uh, the degree of concavity, which for us, it's a measure of the degree of preference for variety. And we're going to use this because it's very convenient, you know, to get our result. Now, take a simple, just maximize the consumer's utility, blah, blah, blah. You get the inverse demand functions, right? And now you see immediately that this x here, which is, sorry, how does it work? Oops. x is an aggregate, right? which depends on the vectors here. And that's going to be important for us because you see that the demand functions here, I'm from I. Basically, my demand inverse demand function depends on my output, xi, and something which is an aggregate here. So it's enough for me to guess what this aggregate is going to be. If I say, okay, capital X is 10, then I'm, in a sense, like a monopolist. I just have to choose my output side. Okay? If you take the, the Marshallian demand, you get something different, except now that the price aggregate, it's something a bit more complicated because this is the solution, and you can show that the solution exists, and it is unique. Right? So you get here a market aggregate, so in both cases, we are going to have what we call nowadays an aggregative game. Okay. So look at Bertrand, but everybody knows what it is. Then we will do Cournot after that. Now look at Bertrand competition. Do I have Cournot before? Sorry, no. Oops. No. I have, we look at the equilibrium, just derive first of the condition, and the equilibrium exists. It's not always. You have to introduce some restriction on the lower tier utility functions. But if the equilibrium exists, the markup is like that. What is it that? It is the elasticity. Each time you see this symbol, it means elasticity. This is the elasticity of the market aggregate P with respect to my price PI. Okay? And here you have the relative law for variety. Right? Okay. So, this term, in a sense, measure what? The strategic interaction between the two firms. When I change my price, how does it affect the market aggregate? Okay. This one depends, of course, also on P, but mainly it's going to depend on my, it's a thing like my residual demand, which I face. And what we are going to see is that, you know, when the, the number of firms keep rising, then this term will behave differently. Now, what under Cournot? Under Cournot, it's even usually it's simple. You see, we have this term, which is the counterpart of this one. And then here you get again, you know, the impact I have when I choose my output on the market aggregate, which also captures this idea of strategic interaction between firms. But this one, you see here, is very simple. It depends only on my output. So it's going to depend on how the relative law for variety varies with my output. So this one is the competition side. This one is the monopoly side, a bit this idea of monopolistic competition. Okay? So, with, sorry for that. Uh, when you combine the fine, you never know what happens. Right? So in a way, we say that these terms capture the monopoly power of the firms 
regardless of the others. Whereas the terms in which you have those elasticities capture the real interaction, the strategic interaction between firms. Now, what happens when you take the limit, when the number of firms goes to infinity, right? To the, what happens to the market? This is Bertrand, this is Cournot. Well, you have to work a little bit, but not much. You show that, and this is what we expect, we show that this elasticity goes to zero. As the number keeps increasing, then the impact of my prime choice on the market aggregate goes down to zero. I have no impact. So this is one. And now you take the limit of this. Now you can show that, of course, as the number of, farming, the number of varieties increases, then the consumption of each variety because of the budget constraint, right? The consumption of, the, of each variety decreases. In the limit, it goes to zero. So the limit is the relative law of variety evaluated at zero. Now, you take Cournot. What? You take the limit, same thing here, it goes to zero. And this one, so, sorry, it goes to R of zero. And this one, which is the strategic interaction term, goes to zero. So you forget this term. You end up with the limit of this one. So the limit of the two is the same. So when the number of firms is very large, Cournot, Bertrand, doesn't matter. It's about the same. But do they earn positive or zero markup? So basically, the answer depends on this is always non-negative, right? Is it positive or is it zero? That's it. Right? So what you can show is the following result. Oops. Take, for example, the CARA uh, utility, then the relative law for variety. Evaluate at x equals 0 is 0. So under a CARA lower tier utility u, the limit of oligopolistic competition is perfect competition. But if you take the CES, if you want to, then the limit of oligopolistic is monopolistic competition because even with an arbitrary large number of firms, the markup remains strictly positive. So as usual in economics, the answer is, do we converge to water? It depends. It depends on the assumption you make on the utility function. Right? Now, very quickly here, I'm not going to spend much time on that. On the spatial model, well, you know, there was an old criticism by Caldor in a review article of uh, Chamberlain's book. He said, this does not make any sense, this model. Right? Why? Because, you know, firms are rooted in some locations. They are somewhere. And if, what matters to me, if I have a shop in New York, in London, then I care about firms that are located in, my, in the vicinity. You know, firms that are located 10 miles away or 15 miles away, if I have a bakery, let's say, or a small restaurant, I, I don't compete with those guys. They are just too far away. I care about the restaurants or the bakeries which are nearby. And so, because there are only a few of them, then what I will do is not negligible. If I change my price, the impact on their sales is not negligible. So in a way, it doesn't use the word game theoretic structure. But we are in a game theoretic framework. There is threat. So no more politic competition. Well, I mean, this was already in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in hoteling, but he didn't know hoteling. But anyway, you know, basically here, right, you can describe the two models in a very simple way. A special model, take the circle. Right? You have to move around the circle. Shops are located min, uh, noon, 6, 9, 3 o'clock. Okay? Four of them. Now, if you want, you are at 2 o'clock. You have to move to noon or 3 o'clock. You move around the circle. Right? You have a circular belt. Now, the symmetric model, as the model we saw before, what does it mean? Each firm competes with each and every other firm. And they are symmetric. So this means what? If I'm located at 1 o'clock and want to visit the firm at 3 o'clock, I first go to the center 
of the, of the circle. And from the center, I go to the firm located at 3 o'clock. And this is the same if I want to go to the firm located at 12, I go to the center and then go to the firm at noon. Okay? So in this way, I make quid distance from all other firms. And therefore, each firm equally compete to attract you, to attract you, or to attract me. Right? Whereas in the spatial model, right, when people allocate and move around the circles only, then you have your two neighbors. And then you say, do I go to firm at 9 o'clock, 3 o'clock, say for you, or do I go to the firm at noon? That's it. I'm not interested by the other one. So in this setting, you see, you get the demand functions, which depend on our price, and the price charged by our two neighbors. Then you compute the, that's, uh, you probably know this paper because of Salop's paper, but actually it was done before by Martin Beckman in 72. You know, in, in this literature, there are many papers that have, very nice paper that has been written earlier, but unfortunately unknown. And now, what's the equilibrium price? The equilibrium price is the marginal cost plus a markup. What is the markup? The markup here is T is, you have linear transport costs when you travel along the circle. L is the length of the circle. And N is the number of firms which are equidistantly distributed along the circle. Now you see when the number of firms goes to infinity, it goes to zero. So the limit of this model is obviously perfect competition. Fine. Well, here I'm, I'll be very fast, right? With, uh, it's a discrete choice model. But instead of using it, because with this pre choice model, right, there is a huge, a very interesting literature in psychology on individual choice. Right? It starts with the, words, the work of Luce in a book published in 1959, Individual Choice Behavior, in which he introduced what he called the choice axioms, which leads to the multinomial logics, basically. Right? And then you have many papers that start to, De Bruyne himself right, wrote a review article of this book, and for those who know the Bruber's Redbus paradox developed by McFadden, De Bruyne talked about two symphony, no, one symphony by uh, Beethoven, but two, two different orchestra conductors and a piece by Debussy. And I suspect that some students didn't know Debussy, were not sure about the orchestra conductors, so it became the Bruber's Redbus paradox, which is much easier to, to understand. So, you can make, you know, this model much more general, but there is no need to interpret the epsilon term as a random variable. You may just say that you have a continuum of heterogeneous agents. And so the value of E here is the, match, is the matching, the quality of the match between variety I and consumers of type theta. We are differentiated by our type, and we have a continuum of type, right? So you get to demand functions when the apps are, these variables are, are ID. And then basically what you get, you know, it's again a similar ID. If the distribution of taste is relatively concentrated, right, then you converge toward uh, perfect competition. But if the dispersion of taste is very dispersed, like again, right, if you take the multinomial logic, then in the limit, you always get a strictly positive markup. So you have monopolistic competition. Summing up, in the three models, we need enough dispersion across consumers for monopolistic competition to occur in the limit. If this dispersion is not you know, dispersed enough, if it is too narrow, then we converge toward perfect combination. That's the basic idea. Okay? Now, the second approach. Here I have a, a quotation which I like very much by, by Maskell. It's uh, in a lecture he gave at, at Northwestern, uh, Nancy Schwartz lectures in, uh, in 84. 
Now you see the, the attitude of Mona of uh, Mass Collel is really the attitude of, of a theorist. Right? So, uh, monopolistic competition is not interesting because it makes perfect competition more realistic. So we don't care. We know that all models are unrealistic. Right? But can we use model monopolistic competition as a simplification of oligopolistic competition? In other words, can we mimic result that we have under oligopolistic competition by using a simple model in which we have monopolistic competition? Okay? And the answer is yes. Right? So, Mascola's intuition was great. <sighs> what do we know? Well, this is what most people do. Okay? The CS. Why? Because it's so convenient. Well, That's the explanation I was given by my most people. It's convenient because just, you know, pen and papers and pencil, half a page, you solve completely the model with a homogeneous firm. But even with heterogeneous firms a la millets, you get one page and a half. So it's still very simple. The paper is longer, right? But if you really focus on what people are interested in, it's very short and very simple. So, why is it that the I.O. people dislike this model? Okay, we have to work here with a continuum of firm. There is something interesting to say about uh, the Dixit Stiglitz paper, of monopolistic. The working paper is much better than the published paper. And Avinash told me that, you know, when he understood that to capture the idea that a firm is negligible to the market, that's already explained by Oman, you know, in his paper in Econometrica 1964. If we want a trader, if we want someone to be negligible to the market, formally, oops, okay, fine, thank you very much, sorry, I had some, I cut myself this morning. Uh, if you want a firm to be negligible to the market, so whatever I do, I have no impact on the market. You need a continuum of firms. 1979, the referees of AR. What the hell do you mean by the continuum of firms? Right? So just, OK, we have a finite number of firms, but these firms forget about the impact they have on the price index, and they forget the impact they have on this and that. And then some people say, wait a minute, you cannot make this kind of assumption, right? You have to take into account the impact of your price on the price index. So it became a little bit of a mess. But basically, people say, OK, let, let's make this assumption because it is. Write the model as Dixit and Stiglitz did it. You have a continuum of firms. The interesting result is that the equilibrium price is given by a dominant strategy. Regardless of what the other firms do, you always want to choose this price. It's a dominant strategy. Second, this dominant strategy is obviously independent of the number or the mass of competitors. It's always flat. The best reply function is always flat. So that, that's the, uh, the IO people are a bit unhappy, right, with something like that. Second, the firm size. Now, assume that we have L consumers. The output, the firm size, is independent of L. So you sell in a small country, you sell to China, right? this is your market. Or you sell to a small country, I'm not going to mention any, but you choose one. Then your market size is always the same. You know, uh, you expect to be, you expect firms to be bigger right, in, a much, in a bigger market than in a very small market. And actually everything here, market size L, drive just the number of firms, because we have free entry. And this model is convenient, right? We have free entry, so profits are washed out by the zero profit conditions. Therefore, the GDP is equal to the wage bill. You assume perfect competition on the labor market, so the wage is fixed. You choose labor as a numeraire, so the GDP is just equal to the number of workers because the wage of each worker is one, is the numerator. Okay? So when you look at the demand function, 
Demand function dep depends also on income. So if the income is endogenous, right, this means that your demand function varies, varies with profits. That is something complicated to deal with. But if profits are zero, you just don't care about profit. You don't care about how profits are distributed across consumers, right, which would affect the aggregate, the market demands. You may forget about this because profits are zero. So you have a very simple model that you can solve. Everything is multiplicative, so when do you want to apply to bring the model to the data, you take the log, bingo, you have a very nice equation to estimate from the econometric viewpoint. Now, with, okay, I didn't like that, right? I didn't like that. I didn't like this either. Right? So with Gianmarco Taviano, right, and then Tabushi uh, uh, join us in this work, they say, okay, let, let's try another example. And now I see, which is the quadratic utility. It's just a generalization to a continuum of form of the standard quadratic utility functions, which typically we use in your poly theory. Okay? And now what do we see? If you fix the, the mass of firm, you see we have something which we like. The equilibrium price, we normalize the, the marginal cost to, to zero here. Right? It's not an issue, right? It's amount to rescaling alpha here. Then, what you get as the mass of firm increases, the equilibrium price decreases. Fine. So we get this idea that entry generate pro-competitive effect. Market size, when you have free entry, the equilibrium price is given by that. You have a large market, more entry, more competition, lower market price. That's what we like. Okay? Fixed costs are high. Fixed costs are high. This means that, in a way, they slow down the entry process. So eventually, you end up with fewer firms. Okay? And what is beta here? But beta, if you remember, this is like the Huffington index. The Huffington index. What do you have? What do you want to do? You just to, if you don't want to have no concentration with the Huffington index, you want each firm to have the same size. You want here the consumption of each variety to be the same. In other words, you have a preference for variety. It's the same idea. So beta measure the intensity of preference for variety. Okay? The same idea. But still, it's an example, right? It's an example. We can work up with this. Look at the recent paper, relatively recent, by Melis and Ottaviano, in which they can revisit Melis' paper, in econometric paper, and everything becomes simpler, and they can generate additional effects that you cannot capture with the CS. Still, example. Now, can we work with something more general? And the idea is yes. We still buy the idea of the elasticity of situations. But why should it be constant? Now, if you look at the literature, that's, that's all stuff, right? Morishima, uh, uh, Allen, and some other guys, there are many definitions of the elasticity of situations. And they are equivalent only if you have two goods. When you have more than two goods, they need not be the same. OK, so let's make it simple. Let's look, we are from I. We have a continuum of firms. Budget constraint and everything. Lambda is the Lagrange multiplier. We work just on a side, on a side here, right? We work in a functional space. Why? Because each firm is negligible, so a consumption profile is a function defined over the set of firms. How much of the variety produced by each firm I in the interval 0n? Okay, so here we have to be a bit more careful because, you know, uh, computing derivative is a bit more complicated. What do we mean by continuous functions or a differentiable functions in a functional space? So here we work in uh, L2 right? because the space is a Hilbert space which inherits several properties, nice properties of the n uh, finite dimensional space. So. End of my aside for those who are not interested in this kind of stuff. 
So here you see this is the marginal utility, which depends on how much I sell. But it depends on the function of the consumption of all the other varieties, right? of the whole function. So let's make it simple. And let's focus on a symmetric outcome. In other words, all the other x here are equal. xj equal xk equal xl and so on and so forth. So eventually, I end up with xi and x. So I have two goods. So all the definitions of the elasticity substitutions are the same. I can pick up any one. And now, you, when you take, choose one of them, keep in mind now that because we have a continuum of firm, what I do has no impact on the others. So when you have the cross derivative, I get rid of the cross derivative because I have no impact on them. These functions become very simple, and eventually, it depends only on two variables. These guys, right, depends only on two variables, which are what? How much I consume of each variety, which is assumed to be the same across varieties, and the mass of varieties. Two variables only. Sigma, the elasticity of situation, is in the general case function of two variables only. Now, if I want to say something, I, we compute the markup, right? It's usual stuff. And you see here we have the elasticity of situations, which is now a function. X is how much I consume. N is the mass of firm. Then you can show that you have an X star, which is the optimal, the, the utility maximizing uh, consumption for our consumers, which depend on the number of firms. So eventually, you end up with this, which depends only on N. If you take the CS model, this is a constant. So the markup is constant. Now, you see, the markup will vary with N as a function of N here but also how sigma varies with the consumption. So we have to make assumptions on does sigma increase or decrease with x, does sigma increase or decrease with n. That's that. Well, that's easy to say, right? But what do we mean by those assumptions, right? What do we mean? Well, if you believe in the model we saw below, entry makes competition tougher, leads to a lower price. Okay. So if the number of firms increase, what should happen to the elasticity? It's again the elasticity, right? So what happened to sigma? Sigma is an inverse measure of the degree of product differentiation. When sigma goes to infinity, then the products are perfectly homogeneous. Okay. So if I want the markup to decrease here, when the number of firms increases, this means that sigma must get higher. Right? Look at this. Right? That's it. It's higher, so the market gets smaller. Now, what about this one? The consumption always decreases with the number of variety because of the law of variety. That's fine. But how does sigma vary with x? Nobody knows. Is, does it increase or decrease? Now, it's where, you know, the mathematics are so nice. You can show that sigma you know, decreases with x if and only if necessary and sufficient condition. If and only if when you have a productivity shock, C, marginal cost of all firm decreases, then the pass-through is smaller than 100%. In other words, marginal cost for all of us decreases by 10. Okay? So we decrease, of course, our market price, but we decrease it by 8, or by 2, or 5, but less than 10. Okay? Now, does it make sense? Just go to the data, because it's a question which interests a lot the trade people. Now we have a growing empirical evidence that really suggests that the pass-through is indeed smaller than 
Therefore, we may assume that this, the elasticity here is negative because sigma is a decreasing function of x. So, under these assumptions, we can prove the following. There exists an equilibrium, it is unique, and it is symmetric. Fine. Now, if we make the market bigger, what do we get? Or if we make each consumer richer because we are more efficient, our number of efficiency units of labor is higher. We produce more, right? We have uh, more skills. So in both cases, we get lower markups, bigger firms, and a larger number of varieties. The CS, this is a constant. This is a constant. We have this one. Yes, not that one. And we also have the pass-through is always smaller than 100%. Now, if you look at papers by Tom Holmes and Coulters, well, on the larger market, he tends to find that firms tend to be bigger. So this seems reasonable. This result that markup tends to decrease with entry right, or in a bigger market. In a way, that's why we have antitrust policy. Right? If we don't need it, if we... If the price does not vary with the number of firms, or if the price increases with the number of firms, why should we bother about uh, competition policy? The number of firms has no impact. So let's have to monopolize the market. It's okay, right? The, the market price is unaffected. So that, that's part of the folk, you know, of the conventional wisdom of, of economic theory, that competition is good for consumers because it leads to lower price. This is exactly the result we obtained. Actually, in this case, in a paper with Parenti and Philippe Uchef, in this case, all the results we have are necessary and sufficient conditions. We identify all the necessary and sufficient conditions to impose on these two guys to get the various properties. And these one are just sufficient conditions. Okay? but you may have more sophisticated conditions in order to get necessary conditions. Therefore, if you want to apply the model, make an empirical, uh, empirical analysis. Try to get some standardized fact from your data. Right? These standardized fact impose restriction on preferences. So you obtain something using the standardized fact like a subclass of preferences. Having characterized the subclass of preferences, then you choose a functional form in this subclass. And then you estimate this. Function. And then you may check whether or not this is consistent. This is the kind of research that Melitz, Meyer, Melitz, and Ottaviano are doing now. Here's the world, right? Symmetric preference only. Now you get these three potatoes, let's call them like that, additive preferences, homothetic preferences, indirectly additive. What do I mean by that? You take the indirect utility of one variety plus the indirect utility of the second variety plus and so on and so forth. Right? That's being used now in some trade models. Okay? What is the CS is this point. Which means that it belongs to the three subclasses. Therefore, it inherits all the properties of each subclass. Now, we know that homothetic preference is a strong restriction. We also know that additive preference is a strong assumption. So if we put them together, you get only the CS. So, but you might say, still, you know, they are big guys. Okay, fine, look at this. Right? What do we have here? We put how, the elast how sigma varies with n. You know, the derivative may be positive, negative, very large, very negative. Here, you, this is the derivative of the elastic substitution with respect to x. Okay? Now, if you work with homothetic preference, you are on the horizontal axis which is a zero measure set. Okay? That's what it means when we assume homothetic preferences. And it looks general, but 
It's general, but it's better than the CS, but it's still, you know, zero measure set. If, as we did it, we will provide the TIF preference, you get the vertical axis, which is another zero measure set. Now, if we work with indirectly additive, you get the diagonal. Okay? And because, as I told you, we may get necessary and sufficient condition, we say, okay, if we are, let's say here, below the green line, a larger market means a, a smaller price. But if we are above this line, a larger market means a higher price. Now, we believe that this one makes more sense. Okay? Now, look at this, for example. Look at the blue one. Seize the marginal cost. If the pass-through is smaller than one, we should be below the blue line. So we are, you know, you introduce more and restrictions, and we are going to work somewhere here. And then you check, expose, if it makes sense. But when here you can give me any utility functions, right? we can compute sigma, and then you take the derivative of sigma with respect to x, with respect to n, we are here, there, there, or there. And you see the CS is here. It, it, it's an isolated point, right? It's what it means in math. It's an isolated point. Now, I also use the CS, right? It's okay. I mean, there's no, nothing bad in using the CS. But can we really build a theory on a, an isolated point? A theory. We're not talking about, you know, something... Uh, well, I want to illustrate this a new problem, and for this, with this new problem, yes, it's convenient to use the CS because we gain intuition and it's easy. And for what we want to do, the building block monopolistic competition is not fundamental. We need imperfect competition and increasing return. So fine, use the CS. But you know, take the the endogenous growth model with the CS. If sigma, the elastic substitution, is not constant, there exists no stable steady state. Uh, it's a bit annoying, right? Because the result depends only on the CS. And when I, I, I gave a seminar at NYU, Paul Romer was in the room, and then after he came to me and he said, I had no idea that uh, my result was so fragile. Still, his paper is a great paper because we understood a lot with this. But if we want really to build the theory of endogenous growth, maybe we should not use the CS. Right? And again, I don't want to pick up a fight with people who use the CS. That's not the point here. Right? But at least we should understand what it means to use the CS, right? and nothing more. This is the CARA. You see L matters, F matters. Take the translog, which is also... Translog is homothetic. In this case, what matters is not L per se, is not the individual income per se, but the GDP here, which matters. Okay. Heterogeneous firms. I have to say something about them. Do I still have a couple of minutes? Okay, well, a lot. Heterogeneous firms, right? Take the CS. How much do I produce? Because you have a low marginal cost, I have a high marginal cost. So you are going to produce more than me. But how to determine that? Well, with the CES, you can do it point-wise. It's very simple. Right? Again, you remember the equilibrium price is what? The marginal cost, you have a low marginal cost times a constant. So we determine your price immediately. My marginal cost is high, so my market price is high. You plug these things into the price index, you get the price index, boom, you get exactly the solution. That's simple. Now, if you work with a more general model, that becomes more complicated. Why? Because you cannot necessarily solve the problem point-wise. You know, how much you are going to buy on a small interval here will affect how, as a consumer, will affect how much you are going to buy there. Therefore, the game between firms, how much they want to sell in corner competition, or at which price they are going to sell. This is a real game in a functional space. Okay? That's much more complicated. Nevertheless, oops, sorry, we can say a few things. Right? When preferences are additive, 
then something that the trade people like, more competition, the cutoff cost, which means any firm with a marginal cost above the cutoff cost is out of business, more competition because of trade liberalization. With the CS, the cutoff cost doesn't change. So what do we have to do? You know, Melis is a very smart guy. Say, to export, you need a fixed cost. Okay? Now, if you need a fixed cost, the very efficient firm will be able to export because they can pay for this export, the fixed cost of exporting. But the firm which are in business close to the cut of cost, right? the profit, the gross profit will be too low, and therefore they will be unable to export. And then you can show how things work. You have firms that supply only the domestic market, and you have other firms that export. Here, the cut of cost decreases because there is more competition. Right? And again, these things are, you can say, you can determine necessary and sufficient condition for this to hold. Right? Homothetic preference, you have this, as I mentioned before, this nice paper, I studied by Melissa and Ottaviano, because what we, something we saw before, right? The markup is smaller than 100. So you get a distribution of marginal cost. Because the markup is smaller than one, the distribution of prices is less dispersed. Because firms absorb some share, some fractions of the price cost. Now, you have also you know, some very interesting results here. Problem, that's for the quadratic utility, right? Problem, if you work, if you work here with general utility, still additive, the cutoff decreases. But then, you know, the quantities are reshuffled among firms. And it's not obvious that the larger amount will go to the most efficient firm. It will increase, but it might even increase more for less efficient firm. As a result, although the cutoff decreases, the efficiency in the economy also decreases. So it is not true that more competition, bigger market, trade liberalization necessarily leads to more efficiency in each market. Now again, intuitively this is plausible, right? But we have to introduce restriction on preferences for this to hold. Bertoletti and Epiphany, you know, gave a necessary and sufficient condition, again, for this to hold. So we have this condition because they are necessary and sufficient. It's nice, right? You can check what they mean when you have a specification, a functional form for your preference. And you need a functional form if you want to bring the model to the data. But which one? Okay. So here, as I told you, things in the general case are more complicated. C hat is the, uh, the cutoff cost, and NE is the number of entrants. Say, wait a minute, the same thing as N before. No, 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 no. NE is the number from, you know, the model, Millet's model is very ingenious. We don't know our marginal cost before entry. We just know the distributions. We have to pay an entry cost. Then we enter the market based on our expected profit. We enter the market and then we draw randomly our marginal cost. Good news for Xiwe, he has a low marginal cost. Bad news for me, I have a high marginal cost. And here now, we may have a shock price, a finite shock price with the CES, you know, the demand functions is asymptotic to the vertical axis. So here we may have a finite shock price and therefore, if my marginal cost is high, I just say, no, no customers. Nobody wants to buy my variety. So I'll be out of the, the market. But see where we remain in the market. So they will, he will make profit, positive profit. What about me? Uh, no profit from selling because I don't produce. But I pay the entry cost. And actually, what is nice in the model is that 
the positive profit, the aggregate positive profit, earned by the active firm is just equal to the losses made by the entrants who do not operate because they are not enough efficient. So again, total profits are zero. Okay? That's, in this respect, a, a very nice model. So what can we do here? Let's say now we assume that the cutoff and the number of entrants is these two, vi these two variables. They're endogenous. Right? We, we take them as given. And then you can show that, again, the markup is given by the elasticity of substitution, but the elasticity of substitution now depends on our type. If, I'm a, if XAY is a low-cost firm, he's going to charge a low price. If he charge a low price, he will sell more. Therefore, his output X is going to be higher. I am a high-cost firm. I still operate. But because I am a high-cost firm, I charge a higher price. So I will sell less. So eventually, you know, things become more complicated. And now we have to understand that actually the elasticity of substitution for firms with the same marginal cost, they are the same. But for firms with high marginal costs, like Shin Kun and I, we have another elasticity of substitution. In other words, you know, everything works as if different marginal costs, it's, it's isomorphic to a world in which consumers would say, okay, you have the same marginal cost. Consumers see your product as being symmetric with a certain degree of differentiation. Now, we have a higher marginal cost. Consumers see our product as more or less differentiated. If we have a higher marginal cost, they see our product as less differentiated, so the elasticity substitution is higher, our markup is lower. Okay. So you can, we, we have, you know, we have some properties here, I won't go into the detail. Final point, a lot of papers on that. There is a very nice paper by Spence, you know, I started in 1976, just before the accident Stiglitz, which very few, I mean, if any, and I was among the students when I teach, and even in good places, and nobody knows this paper. And, and Spence said, wait a minute, you know, it's going to be very hard to say something. Does the market provide the optimal diversity? Or does it over or under provide diversity? And it's difficult because when a firm enter the market in this model, right, with strategic interactions, then I care about my profit. But my, in order to make my profit, I steal consumers from you. That's the business stealing effect, which tends to lead to over-entry. But when I enter the market, my profit is smaller than the social surplus which I capture because I cannot price discriminate among consumers, which tend to foster under-entry. Now, Spence, you know, they, we have two opposite forces here. Depending on the model, right, this is going to be over or under entry. And this is exactly, you know, what you can do. Uh, it's, it's, this is a summary of this point. Making uh, prediction is very hard. Just you can say something for additive preference. You can say something with homothetic preferences. And my last point, you know, is that now, if you take what people call quantitative model, right? or calibration model, or this kind of stuff, whatever, and I, haven't, I have nothing against that, but they make prescriptions, policy recommendations. Right? Now, if you take the CES, it turns out that the market outcome is optimal. And this is the only one among the, among the, among the additive preference. The market gives you the optimal. So if you use this model, the prediction you make in terms of policy recommendations, policy implications, are going to be affected by the specification of the utility. There's very special properties of the CES. If you take another one, it's not true anymore. So the welfare implication of policy recommendation will be different. For example, take several sectors, they are all CES. The main issue now is what? 
you have misallocation of resource within sectors and misallocation of resource between sectors. Okay? Which ones dominate? With the CS, it's relatively simple. You bring this on the French and English data, this leads to a reduction in welfare by 3%. You take the color in which you have the income effect, like in the CS, but you have also a pro-competitive effect. The price varies with the number of firms. But you know, workers are located between the different sectors, so how many firms you get will affect the price level. Not in the CS, it's always the same. Right? So in this way, the, the way you know the, the sectors interact together right, is very important. For the same data, exactly, you adjust the model. What is the efficiency loss? 6%. It's much bigger, right? 3% versus 6 So, in other words, we have to be a bit careful when you do this kind of stuff, because the CS is so special, then you might get some very nice policy recommendation, but they will be valid only for the CS. Thank you for your attention. So, uh, because the uh, time concern, maybe we just open on a couple of the questions. Any question? I'm better. You need a break. <laughs> okay. Maybe if no question, then you can uh, talk with the Jack after on the break. So finally, I I want to thank you, uh, Professor Tis, to give us the. Uh, well, insightful, comprehensive, and the systemic uh, talk on the CES. So this is I, I mentioned before his talk. He always developed the frontier, the model to capture up the realistic and uh, also empirical data. This is he, his work. So please enjoy me. Thank you, Paul, Jack, again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, good. Perfect.